design and development company that I started about 11 years ago, and then a sister company that we spun out last year called Plant Prefab, which is the nation's first sustainable home factory. And I have to tell you, I just got here this morning. We're doing a home install next week, so it's kind of a crazy time, as is the case when we're installing homes. And I'm, I'm blown away. I mean, I next year, hopefully, we'll be able to come back. I'm just say invited back. Maybe not after my presentation, but... Um, uh, and and I, I want to bring the people who actually are on the front lines of making decisions about what happens at Living Homes. I'm going to talk to you very briefly, give you some background about us and what we're doing. We're going to spend most of the time on a case study on a couple of homes that we're doing. I'll go through the first two and then, and then you can flip through the rest. There's just pictures. Let, let me give you some background just so you understand that you guys are so above my pay grade, I'm, it's embarrassing. Um, I wanted to be an architect as a kid, and that's the first slide. I had you know, Legos and blocks and books on, on the case study architects, and I mm -hmm. wanted to be Frank Lloyd Wright. I got to college. I realized, first of all, that I had neither the talent nor temperament to be an architect. <laughs> uh, but I also that discovered that... Work with architects. Well, I also discovered that he was kind of an asshole. Um, yeah. So I was like, all right, well, I'm not going to do that. But I, I learned about developers, and one in particular who really became a very important role model for me but by example I never met him Jim Rouse who was a really visionary developer who did a lot of super important things particularly in affordable housing and he was the first guy I was in college in the mid to late 90s who exposed me to this idea of writing profit and purpose this is decades before social entrepreneurism became popular and I sort of said all right well I have no talent to be a good architect, but developers, it turns out, and you know, apologies for what I'm about to say, but I think they're actually more important only because developers are the ones who control budget and land. So they um, hire architects, and often not, and allow them to do great things, sadly, often not. So I concluded I should become a responsible developer someday. But I was also into tech, and I spent a couple decades doing that, mostly at startups and also some big companies. And when I finally kind of hunkered down to focus on real estate, my thesis for business came very quickly. I concluded that there was a large and growing number of people, variously called the cultural creatives, who really care about design, health, and sustainability. There are lots of products that we appreciate from you know, companies like Patagonia and IKEA, Design Within Reach, and Apple, and, and others. But the production home builders, the KB Homes and the multi centers of the world, don't build for us. So I said, you know, Simple formula, let's get great world-class architects, let's not screw up the great design they do. Let's integrate an extremely comprehensive environmental program. It was very important, I'm generally kind of more focused on marketing stuff. I'm not excellent at operations, so at least I can do the customer-facing stuff. I realized that what we had seen in other markets is until there's a, an objective third party who kind of um, certifies things if you're making statements about the health or sustainability of anything, whether it's food or clothing. Consumers want an objective third party verification. So I, I felt lead uh, was going to be really important in this respect. This is 2006, and, and I said, we're going to do the first lead platinum home, and I'll tell you about that in a second. And we're going to use prefabrication to more efficiently build what we do. So that's what we set out to do. We brought on Ann Edminster as a, a consultant. She was part of the founding team of Lead for Home, as I'm sure you know. We had some early successes. Our first home was the first home ever certified Lead for, for Home Platinum. Our first development, which is six single-family homes in Los Angeles, certified Platinum two weeks ago. Lowest Lead Platinum homes ever in Los Angeles. And sad to say this and, and, and embarrassing on many levels, but what made them that is that they're under a million dollars. Mm -hmm. Every mm -hmm. lead platinum home in LA has been over a million dollars, but such is that market. Sadly, we started the company a year and change before the worst real estate downturn since the Great Depression. Spoiler alert, not an excellent time to start a new company in real estate. And the other thing is, in addition to that, which frankly, I wish there were no more problems, but it turns out it was hard to do what we do working with factories who, for the most part, do mobile homes. So, so I've kind of taken you through slide two, three. We worked with, uh, Ray Cappy was the first architect we worked with. I'm talking about slide four. Kieran Timberlake out of Philadelphia. We've also done a number of projects with and, and our own designers. You can just scroll through 
the next like 10, 15 slides. And yes, we started doing the high end. We always knew we were going to get to more affordable homes, and that was an important goal. And skipping ahead, we've done a number of affordable projects now. But we started in the high end because I understood that we'd have greater room to screw up. And the one benefit of working in technology is that I understood that it would be at least like three or four or five homes before we got stuff right, which is why I was our first customer. I didn't want anyone to bitch at us. We started working with Ray Cappy and our first home, as I mentioned, first Lee Platinum. And I think one of the things that we've done particularly well is, as I said, not screw up the great design work that the architects with whom we work do. Um, I think one of the important lessons learned of the sort of first energy crisis 1.0 in the 70s was that there were, as you know, a lot of great um, sort of green homes built in response, but many of those designs, straw bale, underground, were either not permissible in many locales and or it didn't solve um, many people's lifestyle living needs, which includes aesthetics. So I said, you know, first and foremost, we got to do homes that, that really address the form and functionality that people want. Oh, by the way, we need to build them in an incredibly responsible way, but we're not going to lead with that. We're going to lead with design, and I think we've done that particularly well. We've had 24 homes certified platinum, which, which is a lot for, for most designers. Most of the homes we, we've designed have been designed to be net zero electricity. The one and only benefit of starting before the downturn was that the factories to whom we outsourced our work for the first 10 years, as I said, they mostly do mobile homes, we were able to work with to do the kind of homes we're doing, which I hope you agree may not like the design, but they don't look like mobile homes. And yet, they all, in general, were installed in a day. They're all, in general, comprised of modules that are between 10 and 14 feet wide and between 30 and 60 feet long. We have successfully done our projects in half to a third of the time that you would typically do in Los Angeles. So that part worked out well, but what did not work out well is we were always fighting gravity with the factories to whom we outsourced our work. So good news, bad news, in the last three, four years, as I'm sure many of you, we've gotten very busy as the market has improved. So has the factories with whom we worked. And so as we thought about how to solve our production problem, and um, coming out of the technology industry, and I used to work for Apple, you know, if you have an iPhone, that's built by Flextronics. Apple doesn't have factories. They outsource their work like most consumer product companies. So I didn't want to have our own factory, but I realized that what we needed was a factory optimized not to do standard, low quality, non-sustainable uh, construction, but rather custom, high quality, extremely sustainable construction. And what we concluded was if that factory existed, it would not only solve our needs, but much more importantly, from a business model perspective, it would solve, we hope, um, the needs of lots of people, frankly, many of whom are not doing prefab. So that's why we started Plant Prefab. We're, we're shipping our fourth home um, next week. We're installing it um, in Santa Monica. If any of you live in Southern California, you're, you're, you're welcome to watch. So why we're here. Um, we spent some time, as I know Anne can confirm, really carefully thinking through our environmental agenda. In fact, yes, we used LEED, and we used LEED because, as I said, consumers really dig an objective third party kind of review and validation of claims you make in, in the domain of health and sustainability. Uh, we saw that in the organic food industry. It didn't really take off until the FDA said, all right, here's official organic. So we saw it in lumber with FSC. I think this has happened with LEED for, for uh, buildings. But as you know, LEED, it's a point-based system. It can be gamed. We developed something internally we call Z6 because it really talks about the levers that we want ultimately to get to zero and then beyond to, to move into a regenerative space. But, you know, let's walk before we run. So we're trying to make our homes as much as possible zero energy, zero water, which is to say reclaim what we need for irrigation, zero waste, zero carbon, so we, of course, care uh, about where materials come from and how they're used, uh, zero emissions, which is an indoor air quality problem, and then, and this was talked about in the last presentation, zero ignorance, right, because you can do many things to reduce the ecological footprint of your homes, but if people who live in them aren't responsible about how they use resources, 
you're going to have a big ec ecological footprint. So we spent a lot of time at first working on that, but then we got hit with the downturn and um, the prefab problem, and we had to divert energies from the small company to kind of solve that, which is to say on the Mazo hierarchy of me, Z6 was way up here in, in you know, self-actualization. We were worried literally about food and shelter. The good news is, as I said, we're busy. People seem to like our homes. Now we can focus back again on the ecological footprint. And already this morning, I've been so inspired by the work you all are doing. And hopefully we can figure out some way to work with you on what we're doing to get much smarter about how we reduce energy use in particular. So I hope you saw some of what we're doing. You may know we've moved from bigger things to smaller things. In fact, the last two slides are two affordable housing projects we did. One with Make It Right in the Lower Ninth Ward in New Orleans. This is slide 17. And then 18, we did five homes for the Fort Peck Indian Reservation in Montana. 19 is, is that um, townhome project, our first development, which I mentioned, six lead platinum homes. Uh, 21, I, I talked about the Z6 program. Mm -hmm. And then 22, you can see plant uh, prefab. We have a 62,000 square foot facility in Rialto, California, about halfway between LA and Palm Springs. Okay, case studies. So we have one product on the market that's been our best standard home because we do both standard homes and we do custom. The most successful standard home we have sold is called the C6. We did five of them for the Fort Peck Indian Reservation. It's a three bedroom, it says three bath, sorry, two bath home. It, it features a lead platinum level environmental program. It's comprised of three modules. We sell it for, for about $179,000, 1,300 square feet. You can see pictures of actually um, kind of 1.0, 2.0 has I think a cleaner uh, facade slide. Uh, 25 is uh, the first version. And then you can see inside in 26, 27, 28. 29 talks about what we're kind of doing now with respect to HVAC, solar, hot water insulation, and windows. And I'm just going to give you an overview of both of these case studies, and then I think Anne is going to kind of lead us in a discussion about this. You can see our Title 24. We always way outperform Title 24. That's important to us. This home is 33% uh, better than Title 24. That's important to us. Often we're at 50% better performance. I think the lowest we've ever been for a big home is like 25%, uh, maybe 20%. Okay, so the other case study we are going to be introducing, and this part isn't confidential, but there is a picture of something that is, so I'd appreciate you all not sharing at least that slide, not that you would want to share this with anybody or they would care, but we're going to be um, introducing a line of what we call little living homes. Why not tiny living homes? Doesn't alliterate. Little living homes does. Mm. So we've got some different products that will range. I think the smallest we're currently planning is 320 square feet and the biggest is 800. So the program here is to be able to offer great, really well-designed, smaller homes, both for starter homes and for second homes. You know, one of the kind of less discussed bummers about homes, but you all understand this, is when you're talking about the per square foot price of a home, the kitchens and baths like if you were to graph it up, they're way up here and it's the rest of the space that brings that down. So the bummer about the tiny homes is that kitchens and baths have not much space to mm -hmm. amortize that cost over so that on a per square foot basis, they're not excellent. But they're tiny, so hopefully it's, it's lower cost overall. So you can see on slide 32, a rendering of one side of a 720 square foot model that we're doing. And this one is for really cold weather environments, by the way super high snow load for the roof, up to 300 pounds. So you could also do a living roof if you prefer that, and we'll have flat roof options. And then you can see uh, some of the energy systems. We just literally yesterday moved into design development for a first client for this. So, you know, some early thoughts about some of the things we'll do here. We don't have a Title 24 yet, but we've got at least the requirements for the place this is going, which is uh, in Utah. So anyway, that's kind of quick 
case study of a couple places that we'd love to hear some thoughts on on how we can be smarter about how we're doing this. And um, Ann, I, I don't know if you want to add anything or no. To start um, fielding, so how do you make it better, Sean? Well, I was just looking at the Fujitsu catalog for ductless mini splits, and they have an extreme low temperature heat pump. Not only has double compression, but also has electric resistance to melt ice and then a, like a drip pan. Oh, so wow. thought of everything so far as a snow country, super cold heat pump. And you could match that heat pump to a fan coil, a small one in the ceiling that you could do mini ducts. I was just counting your rooms and thinking, well, they, they only do three ducts, but you have four rooms. So you could probably, uh, is it open floor plan for the, the dining, uh, the kitchen? Yeah, yeah. The kitchen? kitchen, yeah, that's a step down actually. It uh, doesn't okay. have to be there. You can go either way, but yes, that's one big room. So in fact, yes, there are only three rooms. Uh, there's an uh, external closet, but that's a non-air condition. So, so just slide 34. You don't have a whole lot of space. Right. So a ductless mini split compressor would potentially go mounted on your wall? Have you ever done a wall mount uh, Absolutely, and we love uh, mini splits, so um, great. That would be cool. Yeah, that sounds I great. I mean, you can get a really high performance product great. for that description. Snow Country, huh? What's the site look like? I'm sorry? What's the site look like? What's the look sort of site? You speak of it. Site. Oh, What's sorry. the site? It's, 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 um, site? It's, a, it's a lot on um, uh, Powder Mountain. We can excavate it flat, but we actually like um, having a little bit of a hill, so we're going to offset the mods. The south exposure? Oh, um, if you look through the living room, it would be southwest. Southwest. So how many yeah. feet of snow in the winter? This year there was a lot. Um, so it's buried? It would have been buried this, uh, this year, yeah. Right. The Vermont Energy... Energy Investment Corp. Those folks, you're familiar with them, I assume? Uh, no. No, not yet? So they're doing modular houses in Vermont for snow country and they do an amazing job. They're zero net energy homes, all electric, and their details of like mounting things up high because of snow, some of their envelope measures to deal with really cold temperatures because they don't want to have condensation inside the walls, and also heat recovery ventilators. Uh, by the way, the, the GC who is doing a lot of the projects there said, we have to have all the equipment inside, and that, that's why there's that it's equipment room, monster. much, you can go water much water. larger. Water to water? Yeah. What's that? Sweetie? If you have directly under the footprint of the house, the ability to do exchange with the, the column of earth that sits below you mean the ground house. Source? Ground source. Heat pump. Ground source. Yeah. And then. Probably be god awful expensive. Yeah. It, it, installation's yeah. a lot more expensive. We, we, we did do that in, in Toronto. It's expensive to bore. Yeah. Well, well in the mountains too. Well, well bore bores. Oh, okay. Yeah, you get more superficial. I mean, the, the lowest temperature heat pumps you can do for water heating. Them we know of are the CO2 heat pumps from Sandin, which can operate down to 20 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. So if the issue is that there's requiring nothing on the outside of the building, so I, I've seen a detail for retrofits, but works just fine for new construction, where you put the compressor in the wall and you have to build a small box around it so right. that it has airflow, but it's flush. I and mean, when you look at the wall, there's just a grill there. We could do that. You could just build a little compressor box do that. Yep. in your mechanical room. Exactly. Okay, so that could solve the exterior thing. We the need to draw heat from the outside. There's some. Um, so it wouldn't cannibalize in, in interior heat. And then one other thing. So Jonathan Moscatello, who's over in China with Mainstream Innovation, that fellow found a 9,000 and up BTU. 9,000 BTU is like really, that's the smallest ductless mini split you can get out there is a 9,000 BTU. It heats maybe a room as big as this, reasonably well insulated. And he, he found a three function, is what I'm trying to say. Heating and cooling and domestic hot water with one compressor, some controls, and then a tank for storage. And I know that you're really space constrained, so I was going to put that out there because it yeah. seems like you would need to do either the sand and carbon dioxide heat pump for low temperature mm -hmm because you're in a low temperature environment and do two compressors built into the wall or one compressor with a small controls box, which is you know a yeah. more expensive thing, but you have space constraints as well. Right. And then a tank next to it. Controls tank in built into the wall compressor, low temperature compressor. How, how low can that one go? Negative 15. It's a double compressor. Minus 15 Fahrenheit. Uh, Fahrenheit. Yeah. I don't have to Celsius. Right. Uh, 
Nehemiah. So in the last slide there, uh, in the plan view, it looks like uh, uh, boiler, water heater, and washer and dryer are all in a room that is directly connected to the rest of the living space, uh, including mm -hmm. the bedroom. Um, it doesn't say what the, the, what the equipment is, but if I look back a few slides to what the C6 equipment is, it looks like you're talking about um, gas. I, I want to ask you, please, no, 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 not we'll, put any gas appliances inside the living space. Right, yeah, no, no, the two separate things, because um, th this is designed, we want this to be all electric. C6 is not designed to be all electric. Yet. That's yeah. One, that was <laughs> one of the, that was one of the promises that got Steve to get an airplane, is that yeah. we would try to help them out with exactly. their two smaller yeah. house designs, the brand new fresh one that's almost coming out, and then the one that's been your success right. smaller house model. Yeah. Yes, um, I would look at your window to wall ratio, having like 40% window to wall ratio. It's pretty much like 10 times less efficient than every She lives in Colorado, you yeah. should listen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you're talking about the C6, yes. right? Yeah, yeah. So um, when we did five of them for the Fort Peck Indian Reservation, it was a smaller ratio. When we're doing Southern California, yeah, we benefit from, right, yeah. exactly, yeah. So yes, we do adjust that curve. For colder to come Damn. Um, we're working on uh, taking that sand and water heater with the big storage tank, the CO2 water heater. It can produce really hot water at very cold outdoor temperature. Um, and then take a little heat out of that tank for your space heating. So if you're in mountain country, you don't need cooling, then that's your water heater and your space heat, and it works at low temperature. And but you can supply hot temperatures. What I'm coming to understand is that because the carbon dioxide <coughs> doesn't go through a phase change, like most of these refrigerants are liquid and a vapor at, at different parts of their cycle, but carbon dioxide never becomes a liquid or a solid. It's always just a gas. And the lack of a phase change means that when you bring warm water back, which you would. Well, don't bring warm water back. That's part of the piping and engineering. We could talk more about Well, no, no, it's a because when you bring warm water back, it reduces the coefficient sure, of performance sure. from 5 down to like 1.8. It's, it's huge. Avoidable. It's, avoidable. it's avoidable. So, and you would avoid it by taking that warm water outside and chilling it before you brought it back no, in? No, it's, it's just in the design of the distribution system. And no, anyone who can do hydronic engineering can basically just pipe it really slowly so by the time it comes back it's at room temperature or just a, a little bit above. But that may be off in the weeds for this topic. I mean, because you have a small space in combining yeah. systems. Do you know, do you need air conditioning there? Um, well, I don't think this client's going to go for air conditioning, but we certainly have to have the, the capability to have air conditioning. And understand, this product will have a heavy snow load cold environment version and a version that's not this, right? That's one of the things we have to, to, to offer with these products. Because so. the same that it's a heating only product. I mean, it's a kick ass domestic hot water heater, but it doesn't do any air conditioning. But I was going to mention your ceiling fan I saw in slide 28. My understanding is that that Gwellen, who's here last summer, he's a brilliant mechanical engineer, he's, he's explained a number of times that it lowers the feeling of heat by about 10 degrees to have a ceiling fan. So you, in 80 degrees is about where people try to air condition during the summer. And if you have a 90 degree day in your house, they can't handle it. Right. But that 10 degrees could be the ceiling fan. I thought right. it was 3. I remember it being 10. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Because 3 anyway, is almost not worth... Between 3 and 10. 3 is not worth doing, yeah. but 10 yeah. is a thing. Yeah. Right. Well, it is worth doing. It depends how fast it's going. <laughs> What's that? The swarm cooler. Pump cooler. It also depends whether you're naked or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the swamp cooler, cooler, right? You know, you're thinking a swamp cooler just for air conditioning? Yeah. How much room does it take? It's real dry up there. Yeah. But if you had a mini pool, you'd cover it. I think they have a. So, yeah. There's a. There's a. I think it's called Kaufman. It's a German British hydronic and systems engineering company that they actually have hydronic lines in the window frames. And if you did your space heating and then at the end of the loop came through the window frames to dump the last little bit of heat, that would make your approach temperature better and reduce wow. the CO2. That is super cool. Mm -hmm. 
probably not inexpensive. Yeah. yeah. Well, well it's, it's two copper pipes inside the extrusion. I mean, it's not I a big love that. Yeah. You love that. Well, definitely look into that. It's just a heat pen. Yeah. Or a, a, a pipe pen. A pin tube. Sorry. Sorry. Question. Okay, one there and then one there. Uh, looks like your penetration factor can go down. Yeah. I, w I would second that, for sure. Yeah. But I think the lowest U value you can get before it's a double or triple pane window is about 0.22 yeah, U value. Yeah, somewhere in the low 0.2s. 0.2.4 or something like that. Mm -hmm. 0.24. Yeah. yeah, so you could definitely go down. Yeah. Some right. of the slides, they said solar ready. So I'm curious if you provide solar or why not and how many of the clients actually go ahead and put the solar on? Yeah, so we can't ship solar from factories. Um, it just 12 foot limit to the height and yeah. wind shear would take them off. So they're all solar ready. Every home we've ever done, with the exception sadly of living homes at Outwater, has people have installed solar. Living homes at Outwater is being sold right now so we're hoping that, that people will all put solar on. Yeah, but you just uh, exclude that from your business model. Uh, we have to. We can't ship from factories. And, and nor are we G GCs. The site work is done by licensed GC. Yeah. And then we always get people bid for the solars. So every home we've ever done has solar except for Atwater, which is in the sales process now. So let's see what happens there. And the majority of the ones that have been done have been sized to be zero electricity yeah. for what people have installed. Mm -hmm. So Steve Leffler here last summer, he's doing solar panels for the shingles. And I know you at least considered yeah, the solar so shingle pile. Well, shingles now changes things. Yeah. But, um, but they're low yeah. efficiency. We, we've, we've looked at the product. We've not liked solar shingles. Let's see what happens with Tesla or Solar City. Yeah, we've not liked their efficiencies. We've not liked some of the maintenance issues. Well, um, me, but, but also, you can't do it on a low slope roof. Exactly. Solar shingles, you've got to have at least a 3 and 12. Right. Yeah. So, what? you know, that, that, means, that means the walls have to be a lot smaller, or you ship it without the roof and you put the roof on there. Why yeah. does it have to be 3 and 12? Because shingles. shingles. It's not a good did you mean, did you yeah. mean wall shingles? Well, oh, that's a good point, because you can't do solar walls, but no, I was just meaning shingles on the roof, and you have a flat roof, or? Most of the homes have been flat But in roofs. snow country, is that going to work out? Uh, well, we just started doing snow country <laughs> with, with, with Fort Peck, and those have solar panels. And a peak roof for yeah. shedding snow? Yeah. Okay. yeah. So those were our first pitch roofs, mm -hmm. so which I'll was last year. I'll bust your chops over something else. Okay. How about spray foam? There's, there's oh, we do it all the time. I know. And there's a, a large segment of the green building community that is getting more and more down on spray foam because of, A, there's global warming potential issues, but also many of us, especially been to the Dry Climate Forum, have heard some pretty compelling stories that even a well-installed job of spray foam is a risky proposition from a health perspective. I've heard that, uh, you've heard that for things like the recycled soy product and corn based? No, 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 it's got nothing to do with that. It has to do with just the instability of the chemical process. Yeah. So I mean, we're, we're doing bad more. Sure is nice to fill all the cavities. Yeah, well, you can fill the cavities with cellulose or blown fiberglass and continuous exterior slab insulation, and that's pretty much right? Where, yeah, yeah. where the zero energy community yeah. is, is going. As uh, what we're mostly doing these days is bad with, with external rigid insulation. So we're getting, you know, both sides. I want to support that because I mean, what we have is at Gurdon, this factory, you know, that's in Idaho, it's yep. a big builder, yep. the biggest builder of yep. modular homes. It is a filthy, dirty site. And we tried, because they're, and they're failing the QII test with bats, and so we tried to get them to do blown, and they're like, we can't because uh, it will just blow insulation all over our factory and then what is already a, a terrible problem is going to become a full-blown disaster yeah. of air quality in the place. But if you're putting bridging insulation, that solves a lot, not all, but it solves a lot of the yeah. problems of, that QAI is supposed to right. solve too. Right. Yeah. So that's mostly what we're yeah, doing Yeah, bat with rigid is, yeah. you know, yeah. I still like blown with rigid better. Me too. But... But it's a fact. Can you, yeah. Do you have that problem of, like, controlling the environment uh, that will blowing things? It just goes to a special room. 
Uh -huh. um, and at plant, we have a room that we can do it in. Uh -huh. So, yeah. So it's a cost issue, that, right? Uh -huh. It's more expensive. Mm -hmm. um, but well, yeah. Th there's a whole interesting dynamic about what it costs to do blown versus bat, though. I call this the big lie, which is, and this may not be true in your situation, right. but on so many projects I've been on, I go through my little spiel and say, you know, blown is really better for these reasons. It's really, really hard to get a good job with bad inflation. It's not impossible. And they go, oh, yeah, yeah, we got this. You know, our installers know how to do this right. Mm -hmm. And I go, oh, good, that's nice. And then we come out for the QII and they fail. Mm -hmm. Look, Pete's going, yeah, I know this story. Mm -hmm. Right, this is, this is the world. But then the rest of the big lie is they fix it yeah. because they gave all this big, ooh, we do it right. right. They don't, they can't possibly charge more for it. And so it perpetuates the myth that it's cheaper. So there's a, there's a real disconnect in this particular trade where it just, it's just perpetuated. And, and they don't get busted often enough yeah. to actually do it right and, and have the prices go up. So anyway, it's just kind of a, it's a weird thing. You know, it's like, yeah, the prices are lower, but really? I mean, should they be if it's being done right? Anyway, that's just my, my well little One of the box. things that we're going to be introducing at, at Plant is, um, so right now, there are actually four major systems of prefab, each of which is actually kind of a market. So the one that most people know about is HUD code, a mobile home. And I'm going to describe these as these four systems, and, and you'll note, like, I'm moving from things that almost all happen in the factory to things that almost all happen on the site. HUD code conforms to HUD. Um, many communities can and do legally prohibit them, or at least restrict them, to mobile home parks because they can't be permanently attached. Next biggest category are modular homes. That's what we've been talking about. You actually have to conform to local building code. They can't be discriminated against by a municipality or by a bank. Legally, they're site-built homes. There's no disclosure requirements on title. Next biggest category are panelized homes. Of course, probably heard of a SIP, a structural insulated panel. And then finally, pre-cut, where you're just pre-cutting the pieces. Obviously, much more work on site. The bummer right now is that you kind of have to pick a system and do that. But it turns out what's great about modules are, back to what I said earlier, when you're dealing with high-cost parts of the home, like kitchens and baths, utility cores, you can do that off-site, leverage some lower-cost labor. And by the way, we pay living wages for Rialto, but the same framers that we pay about $15 an hour, which is a great wage for Rialto, make three times that an hour and a half west in Santa Monica. So um, you can leverage lower cost labor, parallel construction, a, a, an environment where you can more easily check quality. It's an indoor environment. We have a QA person. But the bummer is it's expensive to ship air. And you know modules have a lot of air. And it's 7 to $10 per, mod, per mile. It does not scale elegantly. Panels are great because they ship flat. But then you have to do a lot of work on site, electrical, plumbing, tiles, millwork. So we have a, you know, it sounds like an innovation, but we're going to be doing both at plant, mm -hmm. um, particularly for modules for kitchens, baths, utility cores, and then panels, but what we call smart panels that have, in, we're all BIM-based, we're Revit-based. Uh, uh, so we're designing panels that integrate your electrical, plumbing, cladding. I'm sharing all this, sorry, long-winded answer. Or comment okay. because we can more easily mm -hmm. deal with the insulation yeah. on those individual panels, which can go through a more efficient production process, literally rolling down a line where, where the components yeah. are put in flat, where we're able to build more efficiently, blow in more efficiently, yeah. and then just about tilt getting up. That <laughs> Right? Not a, not a trivial proposition. Not a trivial proposition, and one, and we care about it for that. We care about it for waterproofing. Sure. So corners are a big deal. Yeah, yeah, totally. So it's a good incentive to keep the design simple. Yes, one there, and then Pete. I had a quick question. Uh, one of your slides it says that you use spray insulation. I was just wondering what kind of propellant you guys are using for that. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know that. I don't know. Did you ever have any discussions with us? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't uh, say I'll, I'll, I'll text <laughs> someone at the office and I'll let you know. Right. Pete? 
Uh, the city of Santa Cruz just spent two years redoing our accessory dwelling unit, granny unit ordinance. Right. And it seems like there'd be a huge opportunity. Exactly. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. Like aging in place. Yeah. yeah. I know we like really were careful with the square footage requirements depending on lot size. So it seems like you don't need 10 feet over that. Yeah. To tie in my previous comment, it turns out we love ADUs on all sorts of levels, right? And so do a, more and more smart growth planners, right? It's just a dare I say, easier way to densify cities. When you have a lot of room in your yard, no problem, but it turns out when you look at the average driveway oh, um, and access, it's like 10 feet. It's like eight feet for the driveway and maybe a couple of extra feet. And so one of the reasons why we're developing this hybrid system is so that we can get a kitchen and bath out there and then get the panels out for the rest of it because you often can't get your modules through the driveways. Now, you can crane over a house, that's really expensive because it's big, big cranes to, to get the throw. Not for the weight, but for the throw. So that's one of the reasons why we're doing this. I was noticing at your, your horseshoe 1300 square foot house, do you have an on demand? Yeah, yeah. And uh, your so we like, we like, we is often use the Renai system um, for hot water. Um, uh -huh. And I don't know the specifics of the heat pump, but it's an 18 sear, two ton. I think to be technically accurate, you have an air conditioner and a furnace, and a heat pump does air conditioning and heating? Yes. So your stuff is all up in the attic, it looks like. No, it's generally outside on the pad. Oh, yeah. your furnace? We don't have attics. How do you... We've never done attics. You burn gas outside and then... It uh, says a 95% efficient is furnace. Is that a furnace? Is it a package unit? Or is it... It's a heat pump and condenser. I don't know the type. Well, um, this 95% efficient makes me think it's a gas system, but an 18 it, it, sear would be a, a high performance, relatively high performance heat pump if it does heating as well. It, it, might it, be is, a, it is a gas system. It is a gas system, yeah. but it sits outside. It sits outside, yeah. Wow. Your, your heating and cooling? Yeah. So, so did the ducts connect directly to the house, so there's, there's no mechanical... Under the house. Yeah, okay, so it's yeah. a package unit. Yeah, it's a package the ducts unit. ducts running underneath the house going up to registers. Yeah. Okay. Well... There's a lot of losses, duck losses, big time. Well, that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, it's insulated below, but yeah, there is some yeah. loss. Well, yeah. so let me put out there, I think, uh, I've been thinking a lot about this distribution system because ducks lose so much energy. It might be 50% of the energy oh, putting in falls out. We use high velocity micro duck. Oh, you systems. use the Unico system? We've okay. been using Unico and having a lot of problems with it, which bums us out. Um, we've also used another systematic candidate whose name I'm spacing on right now, but both are, are high velocity based systems. So there's a little bit less loss because they're you know smaller ducks and high what velocity. They were here last summer and they're here during the winter. They're not here today, um, Unico, so it's good to tell us now. Uh, <laughs> but we, well, well, we had problems dealing with Title 24. Theoretically, that solved. You know, they claim it's low noise. Um, yeah, no. we're, we're having problems with noises, noise yeah. in our units. And I'm not talking about every installation we've done, but in some. We've had problems seeing the kind of heating and cooling performance that we were supposed to get with the unit size by their guys. Yeah. I mean, so either they're not giving us the right sizing or the performance I isn't there. But again, I, some systems are working fine, but we, we, we but probably had more problems than we would have liked, but we want them to succeed. So, you know, well, we're spending more time than we well might The reason I was bringing it up is that uh, ducks are like, you know, six inches and four inches, and then you do mini ducks, which are two inches, and you could squeeze it down to a quarter inch if you're delivering refrigerant instead of air. And so if you had a compressor with itty bitty little insulated pipes that are delivering refrigerant to a couple heads of fan coils, and you could do it below the floor, you could do it up in the ceiling, you could do all sorts of different ways to deliver refrigerant in the walls, yeah, like really insulated That'd be super and cool. inexpensive because ducting is expensive. Right. And refrigerant installations are not really. By is comparison. anybody doing that? Yeah. So having a multi-head, so one compressor that has a controls and maybe three refrigerant lines leaving yeah. it so that you have three different zones and you have one remote control that, you know. To have multi-head heat pumps with one compressor might be a way to... Sounds great. Right. Right. Definitely want to know more about that. You want to do that, John? Other questions or comments? Anyway. Great, thank you very much. Yay!